do this. This meeting is being recorded. And then let me share. And we will get over here. Uh, yeah, either either go ahead and uh, just go off mute and ask it, interrupt me, uh, interrupt us, or uh, type it in the chat and we'll uh, we'll catch it uh, when we see it the, the chat uh, sometime during the talk. Um, welcome everybody to uh, to our uh, OWASP MSP uh, December uh, chapter meeting. Uh, we decided to go with a short form, uh, quick and dirty lunch and learn format for this. And uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, for when we do meet in person, the uh, the locale uh, and and the uh, food last time was provided by Concord, uh, my employer. Uh, just to be uh, upfront and uh, obvious about that, uh, so I wanted to send a, a thank you to uh, to them for for sponsoring. Um, going through the uh, the regular OWASP uh, preamble, um, OWASP is made by volunteers. Um, Everyone can, or anybody can uh, put together a talk or help in some way. And, and uh, you know, organizing these, organizing these meetings doesn't happen uh, by itself by any means. So if you have an interest in helping out, let us know. Uh, reach out to, to uh, any of the chapter leaders on the OWASP page. Um, if you want to give a talk, reach out to us. Uh, if you have an idea uh, that you want to put forth for a project, uh, well, that, that we have to punt to the OWASP leadership, but otherwise they're always looking for new ideas in that respect too. Uh, these are the links. Again, these will, you know, these will, these slides will be available to, to you to, uh, uh, look at, uh, I think the easiest way to get to anything that that we post is to just uh, search for OWASP MSP. And more likely than not, all of the links on the first page will, uh, will get you there. Uh, just for showing up, you can get CPEs. Uh, if you need something in writing, uh, feel free to reach out to any of the chapter leads and, uh, and we'll send you an email that uh, should look official enough that uh, you can PDFify and send uh, you also get CPEs for giving talks um, or helping out with, uh, um, oh, like next spring, we hope to be back at Secure360. Uh, we hope to have a table there again. Um, so volunteering in, in that respect should help too. I wanted to throw open, uh, I like to throw open the, uh, the mic to anybody who knows of employment op openings or or is looking for employment openings um uh, again either either go off mute right now and and uh speak up or type it in the chat or send it to the mailing list and uh you know there's there's like 700 some odd uh members in this mailing list so uh it's quite the reach if you uh if you need uh if you if you want to network uh, or or know of opportunities that you have uh, where you work. So if nobody's going to go off mute there. All right, then we can move forward. Um, if I can. So today we're going to talk about software composition analysis. Uh, we were originally going to focus on uh, dependency check, which is an OWASP project. Um, but uh, Zoa uh, has uh, has had some experience with other tools that we can use as well for this, so she's going to uh, be able to speak to that. Um, I've also used a couple of the tools. Uh, I, I don't feel as confident speaking on, on the tool side of things uh, for SCA at this point, but uh, uh, let's see. So Zoa is a senior cybersecurity engineer at ICF Inc. And uh, I, uh, Nathan Larson, am a senior security architect at Concord. So getting into the talk, what's, what is the problem? So obviously software is a complex topic. It's, it's insane how, how uh, complicated some of these projects get. Um, even even if you're just talking about uh, a website or web app, they can get insane uh, with with all the uh, 
sub libraries, uh, some projects and, and whatnot that they, that they create. Um, I would, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that there is not one commercial product or web app that doesn't use some kind of external library. And whether that's a commercially available library or something that somebody found on GitHub and said, hey, this looks good. Uh, I have literally heard developers say that too. Not to knock it, just saying it's it's kind of a scary thought. Um, let's see. So it, it makes sense to use them, right? It, it, we we all learn. Uh, if you have a development background, you always learn. Don't don't reinvent the wheel. If there's something out there that does what you're looking to do reasonably well, give it a try. And in in some cases, like with Oh, for example, uh, encryption algorithms. You know, nobody should write their own encryption algorithm. They should be using tried and tested and true uh, libraries for that. Um, we we want to use well-crafted code. Uh, hopefully, we're creating our own well-crafted code. Um, but if there is a library out there that's that's being widely used we we kind of have a built-in assumption thinking that well somebody's looked at it somebody has done a code review uh, of uh, you know to some extent and said yeah this works this this looks good um it also lowers the overall cost the less time you have to spend working on uh, an application uh, or a system uh, the less less expensive it's going to be in the long run um, I also, I didn't put it in the bullet point, but it also does to some extent lower uh, the complexity and therefore uh, lowers the maintenance costs uh, ongoing. But do we trust the authors? Uh, do we trust the people who are maintaining the code uh, or the library? Well, hopefully we do, to some extent. It's, it's hard to trust somebody you've never met, um, but for example, if it's a library that has 700,000 um, uh, users, uh, 700,000 people or, or organizations uh, using the code actively, um, chances are it's pretty decent. Well, no, think about it. <laughs> That's the Live mindset. 4J is used by the whole world and it had a huge vulnerability that tipped everybody over. You really can't trust anybody. You have to do your own uh, due diligence in verifying that your your um, that what your that, open source what was that code. You mentioned so uh, log for J. It was log huge. It was a couple of years ago, and like everybody uses it for their logging in Java, and it yeah. had a huge vulnerability, and nobody knew where it was in their code. And, and, and actually, so, I just saw uh, in my Google feed this week something come up about Log4j again. I'm not sure if it's an, an another vulnerability or if it's just the ongoing blowback from that one from a couple of years ago. I didn't get a chance to look into it that, that much. It, the anniversary was in the last week. Ah, that's why. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I gathered from the headline that there are still organizations using the vulnerable version. <laughs> It's, it's so it's really important to do your own due diligence in testing your uh, code for dependency management because you can't open source is done by volunteers. I mean, it may be that big corporations support a particular project, but it doesn't you don't really have any clue what the due diligence of people are or what vulnerabilities may have popped up that you don't know about. So it's because so much of code is open source, it's really important to make sure you know what you've got and what its security posture is. Yep. Yep, exactly. Um, okay, so you can't trust anybody, but you want to. <laughs> and, and also, can you... Can you trust that there will be ongoing support, that it's not going to be dropped or whoever's maintaining it won't have enough time to, um, and we'll just stop providing, especially security patches, uh, 
to the library. And uh, I think uh, Zoe just spoke to the third point there. Do you, can you trust their security? Can you trust that they've built it correctly? And uh, it is a difficult problem. Um, it, it's, it's not easy to, uh, it, well, I suppose it, it wouldn't be too hard to bring open source libraries into your ongoing internal uh, uh, you know, code, uh, code process um, for the code that, that your internal teams do write. So bring in a new pipeline, scan it, all that good stuff. Um, but, you know, it is more work than, than we're used to, I think, for, for like commercial software. Uh, nobody's going to go out and do a code review on Salesforce, for example, except for Salesforce. Um, so vulnerable and outdated components, which is basically what we're talking about here, is number six on the current top 10 list. Uh, in the earlier version, 2017, it was actually number nine. So it is receiving uh, more attention than it did, uh, what, six, six years ago. Um, it's actually one of the... Yeah. It's one of the leading attack vectors these days. I mean, software in general is, but uh, dependency vulnerabilities is a very large vector because you can attack anybody using that package. Yeah. Yeah, if there is a vulnerability in a widely used package, a uh, widely used library, um, you know, the sky is the limit. Uh, if, if a lot of, especially banks or uh, government agencies are using that, uh, that library or vulnerable version of that library, then, and, and we see that all the time where another breach happens and you dig into it and you figure out, oh, they're using, well, yeah. sometimes it's hard to tell what versions uh, they're using in you know, a, an organization that you're not part of is, is using inside their own uh, uh, either infrastructure or software. Um, but if you have any insight into like their code repositories or uh, you can scan for, um, you can scan for the, uh, how I'm trying to think, the uh, banners uh, like on a website, um, you can usually figure out what versions they're using of which libraries, uh, which, which makes it a favorite, uh, favorite thing of pen testers too, to look for. Um, so this is, this is extracted, well, not extracted. This is uh, CVE details uh, has uh, recently put, uh, put the graph of the annual uh, vulnerability counts uh, on their site, which, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, as you can see, for the most part, I mean, the trend is only going up. It's, it's amazing how many CVEs get published every year. And keep in mind that 2023 number is probably from a month or so ago. So we are rapidly approaching 30,000 vulnerabilities a year publicly, uh, publicly released. Um, so a couple of examples here. Uh, I'm sure everybody on here has, by now has heard of Equifax's uh, problem uh, with struts a few years ago. And I know it's, it's kind of an older one, but I still like bringing it up just to show the severity uh, of, of the problem. Um, they had a huge data exfiltration uh, because they were still using a vulnerable version of struts uh, in, in uh, at least one of their websites, probably a few. And uh, let's see, the update came out in March. Uh, the breach, as far as they could tell, began about two months later. And as far as as far as the later analyses showed, that at least 143 million Americans' credit card records were breached. Uh, there were several million uh, uh, people in other countries whose whose credit card records were also breached. So that is uh, pretty much the minimum number of people who were affected. 
And if anybody has any updates on that, um, please let me know. That's that's what I can glean from the Wikipedia page. Uh, this is another example, libwebp uh, package. Uh, there were several CVEs uh, published for this one. Um, used in iOS, Android, Chrome, Nginx, Python, Joomla, WordPress, of course, and uh, Node. Um, it is one of the uh, one of the vulnerabilities that um, customers of uh, uh, NSO Group can use to install the Pegasus surveillance spyware on one's phone. So it's kind of an important thing. And, uh, and it leads to a zero-click exploit. So meaning that you can receive a message on your, on your mobile device and you don't have to do anything. Uh, you don't have to open it. You don't even have to know you received it. Pretty nasty stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, as we alluded to earlier, it, you know, this is great. It's something else we have to worry about something else we have to deal with security wise. Um, but it is also the responsible thing to do. So we already should be checking or should be designing secure systems. We should already be using threat modeling when we can. We should already be checking for vulnerable code. We should be doing SAS scanning. We should already be checking for vulnerable behaviors, uh, doing DAS scans and, and pen tests. We should also be responsible in checking for the vulnerable or, or for the libraries that we use in our in our packages in our uh, sorry uh, projects, so that we're not caught off guard when some you know, some library that nobody's heard of gets updated and suddenly there's a vulnerability in something that we are uh, managing. Any questions or additions to that? All right. Hey, Nate. Yeah. Do you have a GitHub account? I do. <laughs> well, because I was going to say, I can, I can send you the links that I was going to go over. And if you log into your GitHub account, I can walk through some of the possible setups. Sure. Um, okay. And I can't do like, I can't present, but I can walk through a lot of the stuff with everybody. Okay. Okay. That, yeah, let's, let's try it that way. All right. Um, so generally how these tools work is it scan, they scan the repo in some way. They, they scan the manifest or the actual code for libraries that are included uh, in that project. And then they look up the libraries and their versions in vulnerability databases like NIST's NBD. Um, and then they report on the number type and severity of the vulns found uh, using, the, uh, using the CBSS scores that, that appear in the database. So it's pretty simple, uh, pretty simple con uh, concept, but like so many security tools, what it's really doing is saving us for the, from the manual checking. Like, uh, oh, for example, uh, how many people uh, check for recalls on their car on a weekly basis or recalls on, if you own your house, your, your furnace or your water heater? Um, probably not, probably not very many. And yet there are recalls on stuff like that all the time. This is a similar concept, only all you have to do is run a tool that will check the databases for you. I um, also wanted to just show some, some best practices relating to this. Uh, ideally, we update our dependencies, um, especially, uh, and, and include the updates in, in our backlogs so that they can be scheduled properly and tested. You know, especially the security related patches. Um, those should take priority. Um, even though I know all dev teams have 
uh, have plenty of pressures on them to get new uh, get new versions out, uh, get new uh, features put in and whatnot. Uh, some updates do break code, and so that has to be planned in as well. But uh, the more frequently uh, the scanning happens and, and the patching happens, the less frequently um, or the less time for each for each iteration, uh, you have to spend on fixing the, the, the breaking updates, the breaking changes. Uh, sign up for and watch for security alerts in the libraries that you use. If, if say, the maintainers you know, do put out uh, notifications, definitely sign up for those. Uh, otherwise, there's plenty of, plenty of places that, uh, that will send out lots of emails Implementing SCA directly in the pipeline is the best way to do it. What was that? Did somebody have a question? Okay. And uh, of course, try to set up some kind of vulnerability management process with reasonable SLAs to, uh, to take care of all this. Um, Main, the main gist of this is just watching for and patching dependencies does take work. Uh, but it's especially important to keep known vulnerabilities out of production, uh, especially the critical ones and the highs. And, uh, and putting in a VM program definitely helps with all that. And yes, that does take people and tools. So yet more money to spend. Quick question. Yes. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you find? We, we can back up one one slide, if you would, please. The uh, so watching for dependencies, right, and and looking at supply chain vulnerabilities. Um, does it make sense to have a strategy where you have your production library, a dev library, and like a validation library? So. Um, you know, if you're adopting, if you're adopting the latest update, it's still got to go through a process of, of validation, right? Scanning and sanitizing if required, because, you know, I'm thinking it might introduce new vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, at the very least, you have, you have like a, a version that's actually in production where you know what you know, right? Uh, is, is there that sort of strategy going on? Well, I would think so. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, because if if you're patching something or you're changing versions of a library, you're going to be doing it in your uh, in your in your code, and hopefully it goes through like testing. I mean, it's going to be source control, and it's going to have a pull request, and it's going to go through all the scanning, and it's going to go through any uh, you know dependency scans that you have before it hits production. So, and. It, a really good practice is to have like uh, a library manager, like um, God, why am I having a mental blank? Like uh, uh, Artifactory or something, so mm -hmm. that you have vetted libraries that are being used, and so libraries don't even hit your test code until they've been somebody's gone through and done this the due diligence for security on them, and okayed them and put them in your dependency management tool. And and uh, deprecated old versions that have that have the vulnerabilities. That's also important um, to to tell teams. All right, I see you're using you know version I don't know six point two of this library. Um, that needs to go away by a certain date, or or you know you have sixty days to get that out because it's only a medium or something like that. But uh, but it's important to deprecate old, um, unsafe versions. We'll call them. Yeah, as well and, as vetting the new version. Okay, and I would imagine that also depends on the nature of your libraries, right? There's uh, enterprise flavors of of you know like Java, right, as opposed to your latest NPM uh, project, right, which is probably more volatile and. Yeah, NPM's had a great year for having people put in 
really <laughs> nefarious versions of packages and they're they don't check anything but we we ask people do you have like a you know a, a dependency repository and they're like well yeah we get it from npm it's like npm doesn't doesn't <laughs> check anything you're on your own um so it, it's really important that all of them i mean even even uh even what like enterprise level ones i mean java you could probably test but it's still really good just to test your entire code the best part is just to put it in your ci cd pipeline you know have it be one of the tests in your ci cd pipeline did i introduce any um any packages that with known vulnerabilities mm -hmm. of course then the best practice is to have a ci cd pipeline <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And I know that that you know not everybody does. I we I just did a project uh, here where we went through all our uh, public facing applications, um, and you know people are moving to that, but there's just stuff that's been around a long time, and every company has some of that. And so getting getting onto CI/CD and plugging in all the tools to your DevSecOps pipeline is probably the the biggest thing that's because then it's just all automated and uh that's a i mean in doing pull requests like not being able to merge anything into master into production until it's gone through a pull like two pull requests is also really important just for due diligence and for insider threats um yeah <clears throat> I used to be, right. a I was a developer for 20 years. So I, I kind of think in software terms. And it does take, you know, this, this does assume a certain level of maturity in the security program and in the development program in general. Um, I mean, if, if there are development teams who, when you talk to them, say, what's a repository, uh, you know, okay, we've got to back up and we've got to, you know, start from a, an earlier square than, than telling them, you know, uh, implement SCA as part of your pipeline. I, yeah. I literally have talked to a dev team within the last five years. Uh, I won't say where, uh, but they were literally passing around their code in zip files. <laughs> I, wow. I you know, I know people are still using subversion, but I don't know anybody <laughs> hey, who's still passing their code around in zip files. Is a big improvement. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when, when you say Git and they and they think it's spelled with an E, you know you're in trouble. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that helps. Any other questions before we move on? I mean, we still have plenty of time. <laughs> um, I was looking. I was looking at SAS and DAST. Uh, type solutions. That's really a, a separate discussion than than just uh, supply management, right? This is looking at the net results as part, right? Part of your CI/CD well, pipeline. Actually, yeah. Zoe, you've SAS, done yeah, SAS you've and DAS. Like SAS looks at your source source code that you write to see if you've introduced any security issues, and um, DAS. Uh, DAS looks at your running application for known security issues. And these tools look at your dependencies. So you kind of need all three of them mm -hmm. because they have very different targets. Also keep in mind, SCA really only works for known vulnerabilities. So anything that hasn't been released yet, it's not going to find. So, so okay. SCA is not a good place to look for, for zero days. So, so secure best secure coding practices is really a layered approach, right? Looking at all these different inputs into that chain, uh, looking at it yep. before it goes in into your coding, your supply chain, and then as it goes out the door, you're still poking at it, looking at it, making sure it's secure. Exactly, because I mean, think about it. It's like your code might have vulnerabilities. The code you introduce from outside might have vulnerabilities, and then when it's up and running, there's all kinds of like cookie and header things and SQL injection and things that 
I mean, SQL injection source uh, SAS tools can often get, but there are like things like cookies and headers and things like that that you don't really see until it's running. And so you want to be able to, you want to be able to check all of those because they're all attack vectors and there's no one tool that does it all. You have to look at all the pieces. Mm -hmm. And when you say cookies and, and headers, you're saying um, the, the 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 code, right? The, um, uh, I guess the it's data that, that's being cool. rendered. Hmm? Well, Go it's ahead. no, it's like in a running application as you're doing HTTP requests, how are you handling? <clears throat> Oh. oh, did we lose you? Are, are, do you have, um, I know, how are you handling cookies? Do you have secure headers? How are you handing, handling cross-origin stuff? How are you, you know, preventing cross-site scripting? Things like that that you don't see till you're looking at the code running. There, I mean, tools can't look at your code and see if you're doing that right. It has mm -hmm. to be running, and then they try those things to see what they get. Um God dang it, it keeps stop it keeps dropping me from speaking. You need to have tools that can see your um that can see your application running to find the holes that you can't see just by looking at the code itself. They do the attacks on them and and then they can see like which ones get through and how they're getting through and tell you about it. I see. So yeah, you we're, we're, mm -hmm. SAST and DAST is being complementary. I should say SAS. DAST and SCA as being complementary practices. You know, there are some some things like Zoa said, there are some things that SAST will catch that DAST won't, and some things DAST will catch that SAS won't. Right. Now go, going back to the headers question, are, are we suggesting that um, different libraries will inadvertently expose uh, tell, you know, a, a tell, right, in that header to say, this is the version, no. this is my language. Is that what we're suggesting? No, no, we're saying that there's a bunch of different, like the SAST and DAST are not about uh, supply chain. They're about your code um, mm. and your code running and your code running will be, uh, Oh, we lost you, Zola. Oh, yep. God dang it. <laughs> what, um, Maybe I'm Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm talking and it just stops. Um, so it, it, it's, DAST is about, if my, if my application is up and running and out there, and what can attackers do? You know, like what can they get to? Mm -hmm. And SAST is the code I wrote and checked into my own repository. Where are the security holes in that? And the, and the SCA is about what are the known vulnerabilities in the packages that I have imported that are not mine. And I may or may, I mean, you're not going to dig through the source code of all your dependencies. And if you look at a dependency tree for a, for a jar file um, or any kind of library, I mean, the dependency trees they've got their dependencies and those dependencies have dependencies and those dependencies have dependencies and you're just not going to be able to dig through all of that. So you're relying on um, like the National Vulnerability Database to have identified CVEs that exist in uh, open source packages. And there's, I mean, that information mm -hmm. is out there. So what the tools do is they they walk your entire dependency tree and they go and say, you know what? There's this, the, the, the national vulnerability database knows that this library here has that, that has, you know, that CVE or this CVE. And it gives you a list of all of those. And then you can also get, oh God, I, we were just talking about it online this morning. You can also, um, Libraries can also provide a VEX file, which goes with your software bill of materials, which really helps with this too. Um, and it can say, you know what, this vulnerability actually doesn't apply to our package because we don't use that part of the library. Our, mm -hmm. our code can't get to that part of the library. Um, so, I mean, even if you get all these, you need to check with 
the builders of the I mean, the National Vulnerability Database has identified that the whole library itself is vulnerable, but you don't know if your code is using that part of the library or if it's a dependency three layers down, you know, is that code using that part of the library? So it ends up just getting so ridiculously complicated, which is why you can't do it yourself. You have to like, rely on these tools to have done that, like dig down the whole dependency tree and see if they, if that vulnerability actually applies to that library. You know, if it's a dependency deep in that library, and then right. when you find that problem, you need to go see if your code is actually using that part of that li library. Because you might not, I mean, libraries are huge and you may be using one part of it and the vulnerabilities and something else and your code can't even access that because it's not what it's doing. Sure. So sure. it's, you know, it's not just like, oh, they say it's horrible. It's like you have to do your due diligence and dig in and see if it applies to you. Right. Now, um, are you familiar here with a product called JFrog? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's Artifactory is made by JFrog. Right. How how comprehensive is that of a solution? Yeah. Um, well, they don't do anything for you. They just store the uh, libraries that you have decided to put in there. They have additional tools, and I can't think of what it's called right now, that you can purchase that will do scans on your dependencies. But that's what I was saying. It's a really good practice is to have something like Artifactory, and then you do your due diligence on your libraries. You put them in Artifactory, and your developers are allowed to pull stuff out of Artifactory. If they want anything else, they have to pull, put it through a vetting process to have it added to Artifactory. That, that way you don't get developers out in Maven Central grabbing Joe Smith's or GitHub grabbing Joe Smith's library for processing something or other, and you have absolutely no idea what it does. Because sometimes there's really cool tools out there, but nobody's done any security analysis on it. You don't know how if they're even being maintained anymore. Um, so having something like Artifactory is always a good practice. We recommend it to everybody. I see. Thanks for that. I, I, was, yeah. I was asking ChatGPT about that and then it's suggesting uh j frog's x-ray mm. uh component yep. okay yep that's what it's i just i haven't looked at i haven't been in development for a few years okay and i know there was a development team that was working on implementing that okay. um so i knew that they had it i just couldn't remember what it was called but yeah i mean just having it in artifactory so nothing gets pulled into source code in your organization that hasn't been vetted and is in Artifactory is important. And you can have that done automatically by, yeah, the tools in Artifactory, but they're expensive and mm. they're not trivial to implement. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a whole project that you have to do. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it. It says that JFrog X-Ray has an SCA component CICD integration, integration with Artifactory, and let me see, vulnerability scanning to a certain degree. Wow. Okay. Curiouser and curiouser. Yep. Thanks, thanks, guys. I appreciate you yep. indulging me. <laughs> it's all right. All right. I think, yeah, I think that was all the slides I had. Um, should we try a demo, so uh, Sure. I'm. You know what? I'm. I'm trying. I'm trying to see what you're doing while I try to see if I'm still speaking. So, bear with me, and uh, we'll do that. I don't even know how to stop sharing my picture on my phone. Okay. There we go. Um, let's. See. There. You don't need to see me. I'm just talking. Um, <laughs> there you go. Okay. So yeah, this uh, I'll be trying to see what you're doing on your phone so that I can walk people through it. There was okay. just a couple of products I wanted to call people's. Oh, God, I bet. Oops, there. <laughs> I'm just trying to. There's some products I want to call people's attention to. So, 
Okay. Um, you if you go to, to your email? go to your email, okay, okay, you're in GitHub now. Go to your email, and I want to get my phone okay. oriented the other way. There we go. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing while I go to my email because I'm not really interested in <laughs> showing everybody my horrible inbox. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, yeah, I see. Uh, I see a list of links. Yep. Um, so open them all and we'll walk through them. Okay. I'll tell you what order. Let me bring up the email from here. Yeah, I'll just open them in, in the order you sent. I don't think that's the order I want them in. Open the <laughs> top one first. I was just sending all the Perfect. ones I had open. Tell me, um, uh, tell me what topic you want to go to. <laughs> uh, dependency check. Okay, let's see. Let me share my screen again. And yeah. All right, there we go. Waiting, waiting. You okay. Is, I don't see. Screen? Oh boy. Okay. Can anyone else see my screen? I I don't see a screen. I see blank. Yeah, it says Zoom leader has <laughs> Zoom leader seven has started screen sharing, but there's nothing there yet. Okay, let me try this again. Entire screen, just to make just it easy. share. Okay. If you that? if you guys stop being able to hear me, please tell me because I'm on my phone in that. It, I have to push a button to start talking, and I can't see it when I'm looking at the screen for sharing because I can't seem to get on it. I'm on my I'm at work, and I I uh, can't get on. And they're telling me it's not. Somebody told me they didn't think it was blocked, but and I have a ticket in, but I haven't heard back yet. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so I'm, I'm sharing the dependency check uh, page on OWASP. Uh, there's there's a couple of places where you want to go. And and again, all these links are in the slides that, that I will uh, send out or that I will make available to you. So there's the OWASP page, describes it briefly. Uh, it's basically yeah. what I just talked about in the slides. And then there's this let other me, page. No, no, let me go through it. Let me go through it because oh. I have a whole thing I want to say. Um, okay. If you scroll down a little bit here, um, stop. Oh, gotcha. To the download. This is, uh, the command line is horrible. You've got to get an API key for the National Vulnerability Database. It doesn't work very well. Um, so, but you can, I mean, all the regular build tools have plugins for it. Um, Ant, if anybody's still using Ant and Maven and Gradle, it, it has micro, it, this doesn't list all the Microsoft stuff, but uh, Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code also have a plugin for it. Um, you can, uh, so you can put it in your code and it will run when you, when you run your build tasks in whatever build tool you're using. You can also do it in, uh, Jenkins or SBT. Um, I didn't see a drone one, but I don't know that that many people are using drone anyway. Um, so this is a really cool one. There, I was going to show you the report. The report it comes up with a really nice HTML report that tells you what CVEs you have, and then they link to the CVE websites to tell you what it's about and what to do with it. Um, so that's a really nice one. Um, and then we'll let's see, see next I might a screenshot of it actually. Um, okay, I just gotta find it. So I did give a talk involving it, but I gotta find the right page. Uh, you know what? I would keep going because we're gonna run out of time. We are now. Okay, so what else do you okay, want? Okay, so the next one go to the GitHub security, it's the one, two, three, fourth link down that I sent you. Oh, okay. Here we go. This one, code security documentation. Yeah, GitHub has a whole lot of stuff just built into it. Um, and you can dig through this and see what's what. Uh, one of the things I really like is Dependabot. And uh, now you can bring up the Dependabot one. 
let's see, the Panama. I sent you the link. Now, um, yeah, keeping your supply so, chain secure with Dependabot. Yeah, and Dependabot will um, it will scan your your you can set it up either at your account level or on a uh, repo level, and it will scan scan everything for dependency issues, um, and it will alert you. you. You can have it email you. And if you could go to your GitHub, this is where I was going to show you stuff in the GitHub. Right. Um, and if you go up to the top and you click on your name and uh, I guess the drop down that you want settings. Let me go figure out where settings is. I had this all up and ready to go and then I <laughs> couldn't do it. Let's see. It is Anyone know where the settings are from this page? I do. I do. Just let me get to my thing. Uh, mine looks different. I have a little uh, person in the corner. And Okay, go to... Uh, huh, weird. No? Is Mine's on the right side, and I see a little... Uh, oh, over here? Circle thingy right oh, there. No, no. There you go. There yeah, you go. and go to settings. And then go to... Scroll down a little bit. And go to, um, what is it? Let me go look. I can see it. It's easier to see on mine. You want to find uh, code security and analysis. I think you have to go down a little further. Yep. Got it. Um, code security and analysis. And then scroll down a little bit. Um, there we here's go. Dependabot. You can, if you enable it here and say automatically enable for new repositories, it will apply throughout your whole GitHub. Um, you can also uh, go to a repository. I'm gonna go to a repository. Let's see if I have one that makes sense. Um, oh, crud, now. Now my view. It's the same it. thing. If you go to the settings of the repository, you will have that same choice. And uh, once you have it turned on, on your security tab for your repository, you'll be able to go to settings and or to, you'll be able to, on the security tab of your repository, you'll be able to um, see the Dependabot stuff. So it's all just built right into GitHub. It's really cool. Um, looking for... Let me go there so I know what I'm talking about. There'll be a, a there'll be a link on the right that says Dependabot, and it will tell you which libraries are vulnerable, and you can um, and you, you can even set it up to fix it for you. But you probably don't want to do that because you'll break things. Um, but <laughs> yeah, you those can are those breaking changes that we talked about. <laughs> yeah, but you can open of... you can open stuff up, and it'll tell you what to update to and how to fix it. Um, so that's a really nice tool that's built right into GitHub if you use GitHub. But I mean, a lot of people don't use GitHub. And I mean, like I said, I know people still using subversion places. And in, in that case, the uh, OWASP dependency check works really well and has a very nice report with very similar information. Um, the last one I wanted to show you, can you go to the sneak one? Yep. And go to login. So, okay, no, no, yeah, do the products thing first. That was a good one. Go back to where you were and, and highlight products. They do SaaS, they do, I mean, they do, um, su you know, supply chain analysis. They do, they look at containers. They look at infrastructure as code. They have all kinds of things they can, uh, they can um, look for. And the cool thing about this is it's written for developers and you can integrate it into your IDE and it will be like one of the little uh, windows down on the bottom of your IDE that will, you can run it and it will tell you if you're introducing stuff before you even, uh, before you even check code in. But if, can you go to the login? Uh, I can't see. It's too big. Oh. Try 
for this. Yeah, you can log into GitHub. And if you log into GitHub, it will connect with your account. Want to hit GitHub? And yeah, so just go to the one you've already logged in as. Oh, I'll do it this way. Ugh. Yeah, it, it would. Yeah, go. You, yeah, it's fine. Um, <clears throat> okay. So let's. So go to GitHub and go next. Yep. And then you can check all that stuff. Just keep going. You know what? Just, yeah. And then do continue. Yep. And then. Uh, <laughs> <Did all this. laughs> yeah, it's good. It's worth it though. And these guys e uh, email you stuff. Oh, that's all right. It's all right. Okay. Uh, okay. GitHub would be Mac Microsoft. <laughs> Give me a second here. Wow, that is slow. Um, there we go. Nobody look. <laughs> it's just an OTP anyway. All right, so then this is showing there's a few it shows a few repositories in there that I already have yeah. in GitHub. Yep, and then you can check those and you can, um, like if any of those have code, you can say, yeah, let, you probably don't want your password vault. You want something that actually has code code. No, 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 this is this is a repository that I forked oh. from somebody else. It, it's not, okay. <laughs> I do not right. put my password vault on GitHub. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, so. Uh, oh, add. Just okay. keep going. Scroll back up to the top to. Okay. And then. And then I... you can go to. Yeah. And then then if you go to that. Um, if What will happen is it'll you'll get an email saying that the repository has been. Um, has been added and then you'll get another email saying that sneak has run and it'll send you a link to your sneak projects and then you can dig in and um yeah go to projects okay. yep and then you open it up and it'll tell you, you oh, yeah nice where the nice. stuff is and this is a really cool one too it'll tell you what the problem is any of the problems are and it'll tell you how to fix them um, and it, okay, like I said, it does SAST and it does SCA and it does container um, security and uh, infrastructure as code security. So this is kind of a nice one and it will integrate with any of your IDEs as well. And you, you'll get all this information before you ever check anything in. So I like this one because it really moves it to the left. It, you <laughs> can do it in your own development environments. So that was what I had to demo. And it looks like we got through everything, except I was going to show you an example of the dependency check in a Gradle uh, repo that I had checked out from some random place. <laughs> so we've got about five minutes left. Did anybody have questions? Yeah. Any any questions out there? Yeah, so it, it looks like um, the the sneak product is is uh, similar in concept to uh, JFrog's X Ray, um, and then when you when you integrate it with your IDE, is that like a plugin that goes in that does like an IntelliSense thing while you're doing code, or how does that work? I think it might depend on the IDE. I I haven't, you know what, I've been in security since I discovered this, so I haven't really used it like as, as a developer, but uh, I know like I was using IntelliJ and it like gave me a little window on the bottom, like it gives you a get window and a find window and you can run stuff from there. Now, you may be able to set it up to run live, but I think you might have to just tell, tell it to run. I'm not even sure actually. And you can connect it so it like, goes up to your sneak account and provides you this online too. Okay. And so each person can have their own if they want to. And then you could have one on your repo. 
Um, is, is is sneak super duper expensive or do they have something that you know individual uh they have a free version they mm. have a free version that you can use um i don't I, I don't know about the pricing of it i don't think it's horrible i mean it's obviously not cheap if you get an enterprise one but it's not one of those fifty thousand dollar things mm. um but they do have free versions too that you can just play around with or plug in for yourself but then you don't integrate with everybody else very cool. And it integrates yeah. perfectly with GitHub as well. Like I run mine through my GitHub mm -hmm. and uh, I get a, I get a sneak report every week. <laughs> I only get a depend about report if I change something, but I get a sneak up a sneak report every week, even if I haven't updated my repo in years. Yeah. Well, that is nice. I, I have one more question. It's kind of off topic. Um, uh huh. I have to I, I have to learn Git, like the different commands, you know, how to fork, check things out, do all that kind of stuff. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've I've tried looking at it. I've YouTube videos and it 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 makes my head spin a little bit. Is, do you know of any primer or anything that's that would make it? Um, hey, this is the best thing I found for the learning curve getting on board with this thing. You know, I Years ago, when I learned it, there was a cute little interactive one, and it walked you through what you needed to do. Um, let me see if I can find it or something like it and see if I can post it in the meetup. Okay. Because Perfect. it was cute, and it really, really helped. So not the one from Princeton. <laughs> that looked no. pretty good, right? Uh, uh, let's see. Uh Interactive Git to you know Google interactive Git tutorials because there's I can, some cute I can Google. ones. <laughs> I can Google. Yeah, I, I just wondered if you knew something <laughs> off the top of your head. I mean, yeah. it was probably ten years ago when I when I did that, so I kind of doubt the. Uh, no I kind of doubt the one I used is still there, but I would just I just Googled all oh my Git. I wonder if that's like all oh my Z shell. <laughs> Oh, there's a game called Oh My Git, and it's a it's a game, and it's an uh, open source game about learning <clears throat> Git, and there it's actually go. called Oh My Git. Perfect. That was, yeah, that looks really fun. Try that. Yeah. Gamify it, and then I'll get it. Perfect. Thank yep. you very no, much. No, this is great. Yeah, sure. Well, I know. I, I needed that, too, and it worked really well for me to do that. Cool. All right, any other questions before we wrap it? Oh, and I see, uh, okay, um, somebody did post a, it looks like a job opening, perhaps, uh, with Uline. Yeah, I did. Yeah, that okay. was me. I posted okay. that. Um, we, we have a, a need for, for a leadership manager. Doesn't need to be very hands-on technical with code, but definitely needs to understand that space mm -hmm. okay excellent so yeah be sure to grab that if you have an interest and i see uh matthew posted that wizardzines.com has a zine formatted resource oh cool uh, I'll, I'll look at that too that looks like fun i have to Drop for another meeting, but it was fun talking to you guys, and we'll try and do more of these. Yeah, thank you all for joining and uh, sticking with us. We will uh, talk later. Uh, have have a safe holiday season and uh, safe winter. Thank you. You too. Excellent stuff, hey. so Thank you. Yep. Thanks. See ya. <laughs>